My name is Mark, a recording angel. I've been observing this earth since the dawn of creation. The Most High has asked me to share my recordings with you. The following are my records of earth's earliest patriarchs and prophets, collected in this book. Survivors of the Dark Rebellion, God's Heroes from Adam to David. If today's recording contains situations which might be uncomfortable for younger listeners, I will mark the video with the words parental guidance recommended. Chapter 8, Part 2, Senefru. A week had gone by. Every day the boys spent several hours digging in the soft clay by the river, trying to scoop what brackish water they could into their buckets. They had barely enough for drinking and cooking, and everything in the metal workshop had come to a standstill. It wasn't just their shop. All of Egypt suffered from the drinking water shortage. A neighbor woman slipped into their courtyard and motioned to Senefru's mother. Quickly the two women slipped out toward the marketplace. The boys, who had just gotten back from finding water, followed them. What were the women up to? Through the marketplace strode an old slave and another individual who carried himself in a manner that told Senefru he was not a slave, although he resembled the other man. Murmurs rippled through the crowd. It's Moses and Aaron. There are on their way to the palace. Oh, who's the slave with them? Is that Moses' slave? Someone asked. Uh, no, he speaks for Moses. Moses makes the decisions, and the slave communicates to everyone else what he has decided. Senefru's forehead wrinkled in thought. So, this was the father of Gershom and Eliezer. How would his one god hold up against the gods of Egypt? Nothing was stronger than its deities. They had made Egypt a powerful nation. Yet apparently the one god had been stronger than Pharaoh, Horus incarnate on earth, who was responsible for the flow of the Nile, and ensured that it kept the fields fertile. The one god had made it flow blood and death instead of bringing life. Would the Hebrew be more powerful than the others, too? They waited outside Pharaoh's palace, eagerly straining to get any news rippling back through the crowd. Aye, frogs! We're going to have frogs! Someone announced. The people started to laugh. Oh, frogs! Aye, this is a curse. That's no problem. We worship Hecate, who manifests herself as a frog. She is the protector of unborn babies. Obviously, the one god didn't know how Egyptians felt about frogs. <laughs> we think frogs are great, Senefru laughed. We wouldn't hurt frogs, and we don't mind them being around. Besides, they eat bugs. Frogs are great. That curse from your god isn't going to bother anyone here, he said to Eliezer. The other boy looked at his sandals. What's a frog? I don't think we have many of those where we live. Eh, you probably don't. Let's go back down to the river where we were digging for water, and I'll show you. They're really harmless. As the crowd dispersed, laughing, the boys turned and headed back toward the bleeding Nile in search of frogs. A piercing scream shattered the air, and in seconds, Senefru was awake and on his feet. He reached for his loincloth and ran out into the courtyard. What is it, mother? he shouted. As he stepped into the courtyard, he felt a sickening squish under his foot, then slid and fell. Oh, that's disgusting, he said. Kicking the crushed frog out of the way, he jumped back up to see what had frightened his mother so much. She was now just standing wordless in the courtyard. Then he saw them. Frogs everywhere. They were hopping around in her kneading trough and on the oven in which she baked the family's bread every morning. When she opened the grain basket to grind some more flour, frogs leaped out of it. What are we going to do? she asked. I can't stand this. Don't be disrespectful, her husband whispered. You don't want to offend Hecate. She might not protect you if you have another childbirth. I stepped on one and squashed it flat. You never saw such a mess, Senefru interrupted. Hush, his father hissed. Now we're going to have to offer sacrifices to Hecate. You mustn't kill them. I didn't mean to. I didn't even see it. From now on, we have to be very careful, his father said. We can't act as if we don't like them. They're sacred here. Ah, uh, ah, uh, I, I, I just can't stand it, Melinda repeated, hysteria in her voice. I can't have frogs in me, grand basket. Keenan shook his head. I wonder if it's this bad everywhere else. I, I'm going down to the shop and see what's happening there. Oh, well, come with you. His cousins, who had all gotten their clothes on by now, volunteered. Uh, don't you want some bread before you go? Senefru's mother asked as she shooed the frogs off the top of it. Uh, no thanks, mother. Gershom and Eliezer shook their heads. 
Oh, we're not very hungry this morning, but thank you anyway. Her shoulders sagged. I wouldn't eat it either. I'll forget it. They scurred out the gate and found it was no better in the street. All through town, families were having the same crisis. Should they shoo the frogs out of their houses? Would it offend Hecate? Or should they feel honored that frogs fill the land? And where did they all come from? The marketplace was the place to go to get the latest news. Apparently, Pharaoh had gone down to the Nile early to offer his daily devotions. It was a little embarrassing to have other people seeing him still doing it with the Nile still flowing red. Moses and Aaron had met him at the river's edge. There Moses had whispered something to Aaron and had held his hand out toward the Nile, and the frogs came pouring out. Within minutes they had spread all through the town. Yes, but the funniest thing was, said a little man who had everyone's attention, Pharaoh turned to his priests and advisers and asked if they could do it too. They held their hands out and frogs poured from their sleeves. That's just what we needed. More frogs! The crowd roared with laughter. Gershom smirked. I guess the one God figures that if you consider frogs sacred, he'll give you the desires of your heart. You should have enough frogs for everyone to have their own to worship here. And more, Senefru groaned, but this is ridiculous. No one's going to be able to get anything done with all these frogs in the way. Huh, I wonder if they've invaded the palace. Oh, yes, responded a palace slave at the market to do some trading. And it's as upsetting to them as it is to the rest of us. Only the pharaoh is insisting it's just a trick, and he doesn't mind it at all. He has announced that frogs are welcome in Egypt. Uh, uh, frogs have always been welcome in Egypt, one man grumbled. We just never expected to have quite this many. It looks as if the god of Moses is stronger than Pharaoh and Hecate, Gershom commented. Nonsense, little man in the market snapped. If anything, Hecate is greater than the god of Moses, and she's showing her strength by filling the land with her representatives. And the god of Moses has no power. Pharaoh will hold strong, and, and who are you, young man, with your foreign accent? Senefru pulled them away before there was any trouble. They pushed their way through the crowd and started for home. The sun was getting high in the sky, and the boys were starting to get very hungry since they had skipped breakfast. They hoped that Senefru's mother would figure out some way to prepare the midday meal, preferably a frog-free one. By that night, even Pharaoh had changed his mind. It was possible to have too many frogs. A contingent of the royal guard went to the slave quarters of town to request the presence of Moses and Aaron. The rumor was that Pharaoh had agreed to let all the Hebrew slaves go into the desert to worship their god, if he would just get rid of the frogs. Senefru and his cousins followed the guards back to the palace. So that you won't think that the frogs died of natural causes, Moses declared. You may choose the time that you want all of them to leave, and the one god will do it then. Tomorrow morning, Pharaoh replied, at dawn. So let it be, tomorrow morning at dawn. The one god will rid the land of frogs except for those who live in the river. He and Aaron turned and left the palace. Do you think they'll all really die at once? Senefru asked his cousins when they learned what had happened. How can your father do that? Yes, I, I think they will, Eliezer said. The one god created everything, so he can withdraw life from anything he wants to all at once or one at a time. And whatever it is he says he'll do, he can. Senefru shook his head. It sounded a little far-fetched to him, but then lately a lot of things were happening that he had never thought he would see. The next morning, it was just as Moses had declared. The frogs still covered Egypt, but they were dead. They lay everywhere, their bodies drying out in the sun, their bulging eyeballs sinking into their heads as they withered. Flies buzzed everywhere, and the smell was terrible. Senefru's parents had a heated but whispered argument. Even though they tried to talk quietly, the boys could hear the whole thing. I don't care, Mother hissed. We're not Egyptians. I've never worshipped Hecate, and I'm not about to start now. I'm not having dead frogs all over my house. I'm going to get rid of them. You mustn't do that, her husband protested. It might be a sign of disrespect to Hecate. Well, I'd say that the one god has already shown such disrespect that a little more from me won't even be noticed. She snapped, and I'm not having dead frogs lying all over the house. You can either help me or get out of the way. Folding her arms, she waited for him to reply. Keenan pushed past and disappeared on the street. Come on, boys, Mother said. Give us a hand here. This is disgusting. They gathered up baskets of frogs. She made them dig a hole in the courtyard and dump all the frogs in it and cover them with dirt. 
I see no reason to act like Egyptians when we aren't, Senefru's mother explained as they worked. It's one thing to fit in, but when it involves having dead frogs lying all over the place, it's just asking a little too much of me. I bet we'll hear more of that before this is over, Gershom mumbled. This plan of the one god certainly isn't good for our relationships with the Egyptians. Ouch! Senefru suddenly yelped, slapping at an insect biting the back of his neck. Where did these all come from? I don't know. Gershom replied, they're all over the place. Ow! He slapped at another one. The cow in the courtyard kept twitching and flicking her tail. Look, they're biting her too, he said, running his hand over her side. I've never seen so many of these little things at once, even for this time of year. Senefru commented with surprise. You don't suppose your father's involved with this, do you? His cousins both shrugged. Oh, we don't really know what he's up to, and here are things only in the marketplace just as you do, Gershom said, a wistful tone in his voice. Senefru stopped and thought about it for a moment. I hope this isn't another plague, he said finally. If it is, it means that Pharaoh changed his mind and decided that all those frogs just died spontaneously. Of course, he added after thinking for a moment. I guess they would if they got that far away from water. Frogs need to be near the river to live. Oh, stop it, Gershom exploded. Yars Baris, Pharaoh, how much is it going to take to convince you that the one god is more powerful than the other gods of Egypt? I don't know. I'm not convinced yet. But I sure wish, ouch, these things would quit biting. The cow mooed in agreement. Well, Gershom added, I wish I could convince you without these things biting me, and without me having to deal with dead frogs and stinking water. It'd be much more fair if God picked on only the people who didn't believe in him. <sighs> Maybe your God doesn't know how to do that, Senefru sighed. Eliezer snorted. <laughs> the one God could do anything he wants to. He just hasn't chosen to. If he did, he could make all of the plagues happen just to the Egyptians. Well, why don't you ask him to, Senefru said. Maybe Moses isn't the only one he listens to. The boys stared at each other. No one speaks face to face to the one God and lives, Gershom explained. Well, Senefru replied, your father looks pretty alive to me, old but extremely active for a man in his eighties. The boys laughed. <laughs> yes, our father has spoken with God, Gershom said, and God has spoken with him. They just don't do it face to face. God speaks to him through burning bushes and his mind and things like that. Well, it all sounds weird to me, but don't you just pray to him like we do to our gods? Gershom pulled himself up to his full height. Yes, aunt, I'm going to. The boys were right. The biting insects were another plague. Only this time, Pharaoh's magicians and wise men were not able to produce more gnats. Well, we can be thankful for that, Senefru commented when he heard about it. That's just what we don't need, more gnats. Ah, said an old man in the marketplace. But it means that the magicians have now bowed to the one god. He can do something they can't do. The smile vanished from Senefru's face. It did mean that, he thought. Still, he wasn't certain. So what happens now? Well, continued the old man, Moses and Aaron were up early this morning. Uh, they surprised Pharaoh as he was going down to the river. I hear that the message from the one god was, If you don't let my people go, I will send large numbers of flies. I will inflict them on you and your officials and on all your people and into your homes. Then the houses of the Egyptians will be full of flies, but the area of Goshen will be different. That's where my people live. There will not be large numbers of flies in Goshen. Then you will know that I, the Lord, am in this land. I will treat my people differently from yours. This miraculous sign will take place tomorrow. Senefru stared at the old man. How long ago was that? Oh, about an hour. Senefru looked around and saw flies in the marketplace, but there always were. As they headed toward home with the newest news, Gershom nudged Senefru. Did you hear it? The one God answered my prayer. He's going to treat the Hebrews differently. His cousin's jaw dropped. It was true. If the message the old man in the marketplace told was accurate, God was going to protect those who believed in him. He felt a prickling sensation along his spine. Just how powerful was this God of Moses? Perhaps he needed to rethink a few things. A buzzing that seemed to get louder and louder cut short his musings. There are an awful lot of flies here today, he said. Yes, Gershom replied cheerfully. A whole lot more than there were a half hour ago. 
Why do you sound so happy about it? I hate flies. And we don't live in Goshen. That's the smelly slave part of town. Eliezer laughed. Ha, smelly. Uh, this whole place still smells like dead frogs to me. Senefru shot him a sharp glance. It was true. The Egyptians had respectfully moved the rotting frog corpses and stacked them into piles so that they could at least walk on the streets without stepping on them and causing more desecration. The whole city reeked. Senefru looked around. Flies covered the piles. The insects didn't seem to have much respect for Hecate's representatives. Another swarm of them started buzzing around Senefru's head. He swatted at them. These are getting really annoying, he complained, and then started to cough and choke. Gershom and Eliezer convulsed with laughter as Senefru finally coughed out the offending fly and spat it on the ground. <laughs> oh, thanks a lot, he growled. I think it's going to get worse before it gets better, Eliezer announced pleasantly. And it did. Senefru took one look at his mother's tear-streaked face and knew it had happened. Oh, mother, he said, putting his arms around her. She laid her head on his shoulder and sobbed. I told your father this would happen. I told him we should take the cow over to the land of Goshen and let her stay with Moses' family, at least while the cattle plague was going on. But he thinks it would be really bad for business if it appeared we were siding with the Hebrews, and now she's dead. And it's not just that we won't have milk or cheese, but... She and I were kind of friends, too. I know, said Senefru, hugging her tightly. Do you know what happened? No, I stood out there with her, telling her it was going to be all right, and then she just shuddered and died. Do you think it would be safe to butcher her for meat? No, not from what I've heard in the marketplace. The Lord said it was a plague that all the animals would die from. I don't know what kind of plague he meant, but whatever it is, it's diseased meat, and I don't think it would be safe to eat it. Senefru frowned. Probably not. Why don't you go somewhere else for a while? I'll, I'll find Gershom and Eliezer and see if we can't remove her. Where are you going to take her? I'm not sure, but we can't just leave her here. Mother raised her tear-filled eyes to meet his gaze. Everyone's cattle just died. All the pharaoh's horses and donkeys. I, I don't think there's an animal left. What about the Israelites? Senefru asked. Did anything happen to their animals? I don't know. In the marketplace, I heard about everyone else's, and it's filled with dead animals. And the royal stables, I, I don't know what they're going to do to get rid of all of them. And they thought it smelled bad during the frog invasion. Her son nodded. This would be worse. Then he thought of something else. Mom, do you believe in the one God? <laughs> I don't know. When I was a little girl, my father was a priest for the one God, and he taught us about the one God, and I believed in him back then. But one of the reasons I married your father was because he believed in the one God. It's just that when we came to Egypt, it was hard to get business, and it was a lot easier when we fit in with everyone else and acted like Egyptians. We just sort of stopped worshipping him. And it's been such a long time. I, I never really worshipped the gods here in Egypt either. I guess I just haven't worshipped anyone. What about Aunt Zipporah, Gershom's and Eliezer's mother? She believes in the one God. As descendants of Abraham, our people started out worshipping the one God. Then most of them drifted to other gods, but my family remained faithful. Senefru met Gershom and Eliezer coming back to the house. Not a single one? he asked in disbelief. Not a single one died, Gershom replied. Down to the tiniest calf, every animal in the Hebrew quarter is alive and well and noisy. Our cow is dead, Senefru said, shaking his head. Gershom and Eliezer looked at each other. Why wouldn't your father let us take her to the Hebrew quarter? Gershom asked. You know why, Senefru answered dejectedly. The two boys nodded. We talked to our father. He said everyone in Egypt is going to have to make a choice. Also, he wants us to return home to Midian, where he says we'll be safer. Will you? Yes, they said in unison. The plagues are going to get worse, and it'll be best if we wait them out with mother. Senefru hung his head for a minute. I'll miss you, he sighed. What about you, Senefru? Gershom continued. Why don't you come with us? 
You see what's happening here. Every time the Pharaoh changes his mind and decides not to let the Hebrews leave, another terrible thing happens to all of Egypt. You'd be safe there. Do you really want to be part of Egypt during this battle? It is the battle of the gods, isn't it? Senefru observed. Yes, it is. And Egypt is losing. According to Father, things are going to become even worse. He says the one god told him to tell Pharaoh that the Hebrews are his firstborn son. You know, the Pharaoh considers himself, I know, the firstborn son of Egypt, son of Horus. The gods are battling it out. And eventually, someone's going to die. And my bet is that it's going to be the firstborn son of Egypt. Senefru looked around rapidly. Don't say that loud out here. Well, that's what we think anyway, Eliezer added. Come with us. I don't know. I must talk with my mother. I can't leave her right now. She's too upset. Ah, maybe she'd come with us too, Gershom suggested. Try to talk her into it. I don't think it'll do any good, Senefru mumbled to himself. This broadcast has come from the book Survivors of the Dark Rebellion by Sally Pearson Dillon with permission from the Review and Herald Publishing Association. This book and the rest of the series, War of the Ages, can be purchased by going to www.adventistbookcenter.com or by calling 1-800-765-6955. I'm your narrator, Austin Backus, and this audio project is a gift to you from my free Christian book ministry, RXF1888. Please visit our website, www.rxf1888.com, to request free Christian books for both kids and adults. And join us here again for more stories from Mark the Recording Angel.